Ahoy there, YouTube! I'm back here today for another game review. It's very excited to check it out. Gearworks from Peacekeeper Games. This is for one to four players. Age is 10 plus. It'll take about 30 to 45 minutes to play. And Gearworks is a game in which you're going to be doing steampunky stuff. You're going to, you know, collect different pieces so you can build different random stuff in order to gain victory points. But the real game here is a sudoku style card laying game where you're going to have a grid out in front of you that everyone's going to be playing cards on, but there's going to be certain restrictions on the colors and numbers you can play, uh, which will make it progressively difficult as that grid starts to fill up. Why are you filling the grid? Well, so you can gain gears and gain different victory points. You're also going to have a currency in the game which will allow you to do some different special abilities. you got some asymmetrical roles in this game, so everybody's gonna have their own unique power they can do once per round it's got a solo mode they try and throw everything against the wall here but does it stick i got a really good track record with peacekeeper games flag dash is one of my favorite games of all time top 100 so needless to say very excited about this game despite the uh, steampunk theme but is it good let's open it up and i'll tell you what i think Alright then, we're going to take a look at what you're going to get inside of Gearworks. So first and foremost, we have a handy dandy rule booklet. It is 12 pages, double sided, full color, full of pictures, illustrations, examples, lots of examples, lots of pictures, very well done, should have you up and running in no time at all. Absolutely fantastic rule booklet. And the last two pages are just how you're going to play solo and a backstory on the different characters if you're into that sort of thing. So in Gearworks, this is a game we're going to be playing over the course of three rounds, trying to build various different gadgets. You're going to build these gadgets by collecting these different pieces around the outside in this Sudoku uh, card placement style game. What am I talking about? Let's go over the components. Let's get into the gameplay. So at the beginning of the game, each person is going to pick one of the four characters, and each of the characters is going to give you a special ability you will be able to do once per round. Draw three gear cards, keep one, slide gear card in a row, ignore column color rule on an empty space. And pretty much, you'll be able to do this once per round and then just flip it over to let you know that you have done it. But everyone's going to take one of these characters right here, which will also let you know which color you are, because that's pretty important when it comes a little bit later. Next, each player is going to get a spark. These cool looking sparks are going to be the currency in the game. You are going to be utilizing this to do a variety of different things. We'll talk about those different things a little bit later because right now if I told you what they did, they wouldn't really make sense. Uh, so we're going to push those over to the side actually. The main star of the show, though, is going to be this area right here, which I've tried to compress down for camera purposes. But this is going to be a 4 by 5 grid in which you're going to be placing cards. And when you place cards down here, it's similar to Sudoku. So how it works is, if you're placing a card this way, so if you're placing a card here, let's talk about what you would have to do. So first and foremost, you could not place a card here that was yellow because yellow is already in this column. So when you're looking from up and down or down and up, you cannot place something that's the same color. So for instance, right here, I could not place brown. Right here, I could not place brown. But I could place brown right here. I could place this brown in C because it can be next to another brown, but going up and down, it can't be the same color. Now going left to right, you have to worry about the numbers, and the numbers have to uh, either be going in ascending or descending order, and that can change uh, just by doing something as simple as this. So let's say, for instance, we wanted to put something into row two. If we wanted to put something right here, it would have to be a five, six, or seven. Likewise, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, because you cannot place anything that was lower than a, a four or lower or higher than a seven, because that would not work in ascending and descending order. So, cliff notes. You, when you're going this way, you have to put them in numerical order, which can be going uh, smallest to greatest or greatest to smallest. When you're going up and down, you have to make sure that all the colors are different. And that's the main rule of the game here. So let's talk about how the game is played. Everybody's going to get your handy dandy little player aid card, which is very useful and will fill you in on all sorts of stuff, like your hand limits and whatnot, what you can do with your spark tokens. Everybody's also going to get six cards, and the cards will look like this. You'll notice they match this stuff. So at the beginning of the game, you're going to set out four cards in four uh, exact locations, but you won't know what those cards are. And then whoever's going first will start the game. And on your turn, you really only have two options. You can play a card, or you can pass. Now... I do want to talk about passing first. When you pass, or how the round ends is once everybody has passed, back to back to back to back to back, depending on how many players you are playing with. 
But passing does not mean you are necessarily out of the round. Because if someone else plays after you pass, then it will come back to you and you will have the option to either pay one spark to get back in the round or to pass once again. And if you pass once again, once again, you can get back in as long as everyone doesn't pass. But the thing you're gonna do primarily is playing cards. And when you play a card, here's what you're gonna do. So you do have to follow the rules as we talked about, the colors and the number rules. So let's see what I got right here. I got a seven right here. Oh, I almost completely forgot. Let's talk about the objective that you have right here. So you're going to have these gadgets that you're trying to build. This one has a nice little throwback to the Iron Giant. But if you're able to get both these parts at the end of a round and you have to do it in one round, you're gonna gain nine points. If you have one of these parts, you're going to gain four points. If you have none of these parts, you'll be able to hold on to this card until the next round, which will make it a little bit easier to uh, score points, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So I really would like to get B or four on my side, which means I need to play in either the B column or the four row. So let's see, maybe I can do both. I actually can do both. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place this three right down here in B4, and it's going to meet the requirements of, uh, because it's less than six, and also it's not yellow, so that works. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip over this little cog right here on the left side and put it towards my color. So we'll pretend that I'm jade right here, so I'm silver, so I would point the silver over towards there, where I put my card, and then up on top, once again, we would put the silver down here. Now, why is this important? Because at the end of a round, once everyone has passed, you're gonna look at all these cogs, and whoever has control of that row or that column is going to gain the, uh, the little gadget, the little piece of gear that is next to it. So right now, if this were this round were to end, I would get B and I would get four, which means I could complete that card I had and gain nine points, which is a lot of points in the game. But as soon as somebody else goes down here or right here, they're going to take it from me. But that would be the end of my turn unless I decide to spend sparks. Now you have your two main actions, which are passing and playing cards, but let's talk about playing sparks. So there's a couple different things you can do with sparks. And actually I completely forgot one of the coolest aspects of this game which is that when you lay down a card, you always want to check to see if you gain a spark. So you can gain a spark if your card, uh, I don't even know what the correct word would be, matches with everything else. Uh, so let me just give you an example right here. Let's say that I put a three right here. That's a perfectly legal move. We would adjust this thing here and we'd adjust that thing here, but we're gonna ignore that for right now. But you look at all the cards that are right next to that card, the cards that are closest to you. And if you can equal this number by either plussing or minusing the cards that are next to you, you can do it. So let's just say in this example, I have a, uh, oh, what would work here? A five, yeah, sure, put a five right there. So I just laid down this three, and I'm looking here and I'm saying, oh, five minus three, that's two, three plus five, that's eight, six minus three, equals three, which is great for me, which means I would earn a spark. So there's an extra added element to where you place your cards, because yes, you wanna be going for the gear that you'd like, but also if you do it like that, you're gonna be able to potentially gain extra sparks. Now let's talk about what you can do with those sparks. So first and foremost, at the end of the game, sparks are gonna be worth one victory point. So it's just a victory point, which is great. But you can also spend one spot spark to draw a gear card. So you're gonna get more of these cards. And that is the only way you are going to gain cards during a round. At the beginning of the round, you're gonna draw some cards, but in the middle of a round, that's the only way you're going to draw cards, which you will do a lot because you're really kinda, of, you're, you're like gambling a little bit, like I really need the seven, I really need a seven, I really need a seven, or I really need a blue, or something like that. Next, you can re-enter a round, which I already talked about, so if you pass, you can spend a spark to get back in. Next thing you can do is you can replace a gear card. How this works is that you put a card on top of another card. So let's just say uh, I really wanna take control of C. What I can do is I can spend two sparks and then I can put my card on top of this card as long as it still meets the requirements, which it does, blue and green, different colors, and it's in between five and seven, or in this case it is seven, which means that would work and I would once again uh, take control of stuff. The only catch is when you do this, you can't gain a spark by uh, checking for the math thing. Now, uh, what happens in this particular instance, in case you're wondering, there's a seven here, there's a seven here. Well, you have to play a seven right here. There's, there's no choice in the matter. You have to play a seven and it can't be a brown seven. 
But anywho, that's what you're going to do. You're going to continue to do this, playing down cards, spending sparks, drawing cards, gaining sparks until you finish at the end of the round, at which point you will check to see who has earned all the different, um, all the different rows and columns, at which point all of those people are going to gain the gadget. So for instance, uh, silver would gain this one and this one and uh, this one. So I would have gained three gadgets. Let's just say I gained these three gadgets right here, hypothetically. Let's take a look at what I got going on here. Uh, I actually got one of mine. So I would say, hey, I scored four points, and I would put this off to the side. Now, the other thing is, and this is interesting, you cannot save your your little pieces of machinery from round to round to round. You have to discard them over to the side. Now, they're still going to be worth two points at the end of the game, which is great number of points. So in essence, I picked up eight points this round. But you can't just hoard pieces of gear and then, uh, and then turn them in later on in the game. Oh, last action I forgot to talk about is you can spend two sparks to draw yourself an additional gear card. Once the round is over, you're gonna clear out this area right down here. Uh, you're gonna gain five cards. If you're really losing pretty poorly, you're going to gain sparks. It has a little bit of a catch-up mechanism right there. You're going to set out four more cards back up to start at the beginning, and then you are going to get one more gadget card to build, and you're going to rinse, wash, and repeat over the course of three rounds. Whoever has the most points at the end of three rounds will be the winner of Gearworks. And that in a nutshell is how the game is played. Alrighty then, gear works from Peacekeeper Games. What are my final thoughts? Let's go to the pros, let's go to the cons. First, on the con side, game's not going to be for everybody for a variety of different reasons. One to four players is not a terrible player count, but still, if you're not looking to play a solo game, two to four players is a uh, very restricted player count. Another con that I have with this game is the theme, you know, it's steampunk. It's the same steampunk you've already seen. If you like steampunk, then you might like the theme. If you don't like steampunk, then you won't like the theme. I didn't personally like the artwork, but I talked to everybody who I played it with, and I was like, do you like this artwork? And they're like, yeah. So that's just me being a curmudgeon, a stick in the mud, a lame-o, poopy pants guy. Um, continuing on, you got a lot more control in the two-player game versus the four-player game. It has that sort of abstract strategy element where once you're playing four players, it's kind of woo, 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 wild west, and there's a lot less forward planning because you kind of have to adjust to what other people are playing on the board whereas when you're playing two players or even one player it's uh you can do a lot more forward planning so you just need to know that it's going to give you a slightly different experience from one or two players up to four players not really a con but something that i do like to mention any other cons that i have with the game i'm really struggling here on these cons you know um the playmat the playmat's the way to go the game does not come with the playmat but there is a playmat that you can get and i would recommend getting that i mean it's not a issue playing without the playmat because i don't have the playmat but after seeing it being played with the playmat i really do want the playmat so i guess that's kind of a con splurge and get the playmat if this game looks like it might be for you I wish there was more than four characters. There's only four characters in the game. I think it'd be nice if they had maybe five, six, seven. So if you're playing a four-player game, you can mix it up, pick different characters. And that's what I got on the con side. I really don't have too many cons with this game. Uh, you know, it can't be repetitive. You're going to do the same thing over and over again. You know, it's just number, 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 spend spark, number, number, maybe pass, 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 score the thing, do the stuff, score the thing, do the stuff. It's It can get somewhat repetitive. But that's, that's all I got. Moving on to the pros, I really stick and like Gearworks. This is immediately going into my collection. Kids in my class really like this game. The 10 and 11 year olds I played it with thought it was great. They wanted to play it again and again and again. The adults that I played it with, the game group, they really liked this game as well. It was interesting. It was thinky. It's that kind of game that has some pretty interesting things going on, despite the fact it's a 30 or 40 minute game. It really does pack a good deal of a punch for a short time span. So what did I like about the game? First and foremost... I liked the fact that, despite the fact I was doing pretty much the same thing over and over again, there was a lot to take into account with this game. And that's another thing, you might get a little bit of analysis paralysis if you'll have a lot of cards in your hand at the end of a round. And I did see someone do that. So that is one more comment I want to mention, that there can be some analysis paralysis with this game if you are prone to that sort of thing. But I don't think most people are going to have that issue. But continuing on with the pros, I really liked <clears throat> trying to figure out what I was going to do each turn. It's like, all right, I need to get B and I need to get D. And I need to really focus on those two. But at the same time, it's like, oh, but if I play here, I'm going to take control of C and I'm going to take control of two. 
and I can play this card, which is going to get me an extra spark because four minus two is two. So, mm, do I want to go here? Do I want to go there? And at the same time, you like you look at other people's hands. You're like, oh, they only got one card. So I could really be kind of a jerk here and place this seven, uh, you know, three rows down from this other seven, which means these two spots in the middle just have to be sevens. And there definitely is some forward planning in this game uh, based on what numbers are in your hand. And I do like that aspect of the game. I also like the fact that the currency in the game, I love spending victory points. I love games that are like, oh, you want to you wanna do cool stuff? Hey, just spend your victory points. And when you have like a victory point track, I feel like people are a lot more like, oh, I don't want to spend my victory points. I don't want to knock myself back on the victory point track. But when you have these cool little sparks that automatically just look like currency, you're like, eh, yeah, I'll spend it. I'm spending two victory points to pick a gadget card and that might potentially get me four or nine victory points. And I like that aspect of the game. And towards the end of the game, and actually in all the rounds we had this, uh, people started to learn that. And it's like, well, it's kind of gambling right here. I feel like I'm losing for sure, but if I spend these sparks, since I'm probably gonna win three or four gadgets, I might get the card that might just sync up perfectly and I might just, you know, turn two victory points into nine victory points. Well, actually technically be turning six victory points into nine victory points, but I'm not gonna go analysis paralysis on you. I like that, but at the same time, I played this with 10 and 11 year olds, they really stick and enjoy the game as well too, so I definitely think this is going to be a great family game, I think this is a great game night game, let's talk about solo play, because I always like to mention solo play in games like this, I am, a guy, I would play a lot more solo if I didn't have two kids, a wife, and you know, a couple different game nights, but I always try and try games solo, uh, especially before I teach them. And this game has a really enjoyable solo mode. It was very difficult, and there's like five different versions of difficulty. It's a great way to learn the base game as well. And it's not just one of those games where it's like, hey, try and beat your high score. It's like, hey, you're trying to beat this Leviathan, whatever, whatever that is. It's like a weird-looking dragon guy. But I liked it. I liked the solo version of the game. And if I actually had time to play solo games, I think I would revisit this to play solo from time to time. So in the end, Gearworks from Peacekeeper Games, high recommendation. I think this is a great game immediately onto my shelf. I don't have too many holes to poke into it. I wish it went to five players. I wish maybe there was another different uh, solo bot that you could go against that was slightly different. I wish that there were some more special ability cards. And I wish I would have got the play mat. But other than that, I think it is a great game. Wholeheartedly, re wholeheartedly recommend this one. I'll put this one up next to Flag Dash. Ge Peacekeeper Games. Two for two for me right now. So needless to say, very excited to see what comes out from them next. If you like sudoku style games, family weight games, steampunk, definitely go to check this one out. That is Gearworks from Peacekeeper Games. If you enjoyed this review, please sure click on that subscribe button down below in the comments below. Let me know what is your favorite movie of all time. For me personally, I'm a huge Leonardo DiCaprio fan. My favorite actor of all time though is John Cusack, oddly enough, which by the way, MCU, DCU, swipe him up. He'd be a fantastic superhero. Uh, but I would probably go with Inception. It used to be The Departed. Like, I love The Departed so much with Mark Wahlberg and Leonardo DiCaprio, Jack Nicholson, and, and uh, Matt Damon. And then I watched The Inception, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Then I watched it a second time, and I was like, oh my god, it's even better. And it, I just, uh, Inception. Inception is my favorite movie of all time. But let me know. What in the comments below. What is your favorite movie of all time? And as always, thanks for your time, YouTube.